Today, my name's Craig Turp. I'm the editor of Emerging Europe. Um, I've got a wonderful group of uh, guests joining me for, for this discussion dedicated to the subject of green energy, renewable energy, energy security, and how this fits in with the, you know, the current need to, to ensure that Central and Eastern Europe, um, you know, its wider needs for, for energy security, which have obviously been, you know, thrown into um, a great deal of jeopardy, shall we say, by, by current events. Um, joining me on stage, I've got um, to my right here, Drew Bond, who is co-founder and president of uh, C3 Solutions. Thanks for, for joining us, Drew. Um, next to him is Teofil Murishan, who is um, chairman of E-Infra and Nova Power and Gas at, uh, in, in Romania. Uh, we've got Anna Gorachka, who is the chief green officer at Polish retailer Zabka, who you might have heard speaking this morning in the other session if you were there. And on my far right, I've got Alexander Dvaladze, who is the general manager of GE Hydro Solutions, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, before I let you loose, uh, a few words of my own. Um, you know, obviously addressing climate change and accelerating the, you know, the green transition as it's being called, you know, it's more closely than ever linked to energy security. It's a political priority now for, for Europe especially for some of those countries in, you know, the region that we call emerging Europe, which find themselves landlocked and have been, you know, overly reliant on one country to the east, as we'll, we'll refer to it, for, for fossil fuel supplies. Um, investment and research into these things is, is, you know, into alternative energy is growing all the time, but possibly not at the pace at the moment where we can ensure in the short term, uh, you know, moving from volatile supply streams and high energy prices to more affordable, secure and, and, and clean energy. I, I, you know, I'm just thinking of what happened in Germany, um, you know, just last week where we saw the, you know, uh, almost unthinkable case of Germany's Greens saying that we need to reopen coal mines, which I, can, I think that kind of illustrates very well the, the situation that we're in. Um, Drew, you're on my right here. I'm going to come to you first, put you on the spot a little bit and, you know, perhaps taking that example from Germany, um, is it fair to say that current events, and you know, in particular I'm referring to, to Russia's war on Ukraine, um, you know, have, have they caught a few countries out? You know, not necessarily countries, as you know, governments, sectors, you know, energy suppliers, you know, have they been caught unprepared a little bit? Yeah, thanks for that question. And I, I think it's a really important question because uh, you know, I think it goes without saying that the war in Ukraine has changed everything. Uh, and in fact, uh, on that day in February, I got a, an email from a friend of mine that uh, we've been working in the clean energy space since the early 2000s. Uh, and and it, it, it merely said, looks like energy security is back in the front seat. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, think, um, I think hopefully there's some lessons learned from this. Um, you know, and, and I think historically there's been, uh, I'll call them, uh, you know, finger pointing, or I hate to use the word bombs in this context, but political bombs uh, being thrown at one side or the other uh, in terms of climate change is real, climate change is not real, fossil fuels are good, renewable energy is bad, vice versa, right? Take your pick. There's no, no way to navigate through that in a way that is actually uh, uh, really sustainable from, a, from an argument standpoint. I, I think where, where we're coming from, and my organization is uh, C3 Solutions, stands for the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. And I know that not often do you hear those words conservative and climate together. Um, but there is, there's quite a bit of movement in the United States, I'll say, uh, for real solutions. And I think a recognition that uh, to help solve the climate challenge, you need all best minds at the table. And, and to have durable solutions, it cannot be just from one side or the other, that you have to have a robust debate and you have to have policies from, from all sides approaching this from a solution standpoint. And, and I'll just say, you know, one of the flagship products that we have published just last year at the Glasgow uh, UN COP26 meeting uh, is called Free Economies Are Clean Economies. And so here's some good news. The good news for free marketeers uh, is that economic freedom leads to a cleaner environment. And so it's not a magic solution, but it's the foundation upon which uh, you really 
can only build to get to a cleaner energy future faster. And, and it's not just our opinion. We took data from the Index of Economic Freedom, which the Heritage Foundation has published for almost 30 years, ranks countries around the world in terms of regulatory efficiency, tax policy, size of government, um, you know, debt, key, key things like that, that that help you understand is, is a government efficient corruption. Uh, and, and then together that data set with an environmental performance index that Yale University publishes. So this is not, you know, Heritage is obviously conservative. Yale is obviously not. When you put the data together, what you see is that economic freedom historically leads to a cleaner environment. And I think as innovators, we know this. I mean, I have a solar company. Um, in addition to my nonprofit, I know that innovation needs economic freedom. And so, you know, I commend the, the Andrew and you, the planners of this summit, uh, for your focus on uh, free markets and also a focus on, on democracy, because that really is what is at stake here. Okay, well, th well, thanks. I mean, you know, you, you've kind of suggested that, you know, it, it's the private sector that should be leading this. And, you know, next to you, we've got, you know, Teofil Murashan from, you know, the private sector from one of Romania's uh, largest energy companies. I mean, you know, Teofil, what's, um, what's interesting for me is the, you know, in the last couple of weeks in Romania, we've seen legislation passed which will allow its, you know, Black Sea gas reserves, which, you know, I think are generally well known to finally be, you know, coming on, on stream relatively soon. You know, there's been a blockage for years because of, you know, legislation that, um, that was taxing it far too high. Um, but tell us about what you're doing because, you know, it, it, there's, there's more than gas that we can take from the Black Sea, which I think is, is, is what you're involved in at the moment. There's also wind, you know. Yes, thank you for this invitation. It's a good opportunity to talk in such a amazing event and welcome with uh, this kind of events emerging in Europe. Uh, my company, my group of companies are involved in infrastructure, building infrastructure, energy, telecom, some civil works, at the same time investing in our own energy companies. So we are an engineering company so we are very close of infrastructure, big projects in Romania. Uh, Black Sea could deliver gas to Europe, of course. At the same time, this is, there is a huge potential in wind offshore farms in Black Sea. The potential is around 12 gigawatts. Only in Romania, maybe with Bulgaria, it's even higher the potential for sure. The problem, all of us now, it's not only to develop renewables, same time have a problem of balancing these unpredictable renewable resources. And in a all way, we are using hydropower plants or gas power plants or interconnectors between countries. Now I'd like to talk about this idea where Romania nowadays has a very important project on the table to exploit these resources in offshore wind farm. The idea is to have an interconnector between the Black Sea Bucharest and Hungary. But the original, the originality in the project is to put this high voltage DC cable along the gas pipeline, along the Brua. Brua is an interconnector in gas between Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and Austria. It's already in function in Bulgaria and Romania, and we all hope will be continuing in Hungary and uh, Austria. The corridor of this gas pipeline is around 20 meters. So there is enough distance to use it for the high voltage DC cables. 
and now using DC, we don't have the problem between interferences between gas pipeline and DC. So we can have energy coming from from the, the Black from the, Sea, from the Black Sea, both from the gas Black sea. and exactly. wind running through the same. Exactly. Not only mm -hmm. to the from the uh, Romanian offshore wind farm, but at the same time, Romania could be then interconnected to other countries mm -hmm. with subsea cables, like I don't know Georgia, Azerbaijan, other countries. So the green energy could come not only from Europe but also from other countries. In this project, it's very interesting. We are working together, the big state companies with the private companies and other foreign technology companies. And I do hope very soon the project will be public and other country can continue. In fact, it's the same project as technology as it should link in Germany, connecting the North Germany with the South. Uh, in this way, the region, not only Romania, because we are talking about the advantage of the region where we are, that means East Europe, Balkans, can take advantage and working together, having connectors, interconnectors between countries. And how, how, how far are we away from that happening? I mean, you know, how, what, what do we now need to do to make that happen? Now we are working about um, uh, technical studies, like electronic compatibility uh, with high voltage power cable uh, producers uh, to be sure that everything is correct technically and at the same time to to promote to EU for the funds. Okay. Um, Alexander, I'm going to come to you next. Um, I know you're not in order, but we've just heard about wind. So I know that you're hydro. So, you know, I want you to tell me um, <clears throat> about the role of hydro, really. I mean, some of the countries in our region are already heavily reliant on, on, on hydro, particularly in the Balkans. Um, you know, where else can we take it and, you know, how much potential is there for, for hydro? Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me uh, today, this afternoon here. Uh, I'm really very honoured to participate in this event and uh, would like to say straightforward that hydro is forgotten giant. We know hydro is the one of the best source of energy. And for European Union, for all the emerging countries in, European, in, in Europe, it's absolutely necessary to understand that without hydro, it will be impossible to achieve net zero target, which we are committed to. So it's forgotten giant, it has to be put on the top of the agenda. And all the countries has to take it really seriously. Otherwise, without development, without investment in hydro power, it will be very difficult to achieve this net, net, uh, net zero emission. It's a clean, it's sustainable. I would like to underline, it is not intermittent source of power. And it's, it's, it's beautiful, it's amazing. And we should not invent bicycle. It exists for centuries and centuries. So why not to take advantage of such a tremendous knowledge of using hydropower and generate clean energy, green energy. So not only to generate, but also to store energy because hydropower allows us to store energy. It's, it's a natural battery. This is the only possibility with hydro to store energy for a long, long time. Unfortunately, no other solution, no other technology allows us to do so. And moreover, I really appreciate what you are saying about the wind in Romania, because we know this country very well and we are very much admired that Romanian government 
intends to invest a lot in rehabilitation of hydropower plant. Hydroelectrica, which is the state-owned company in Romania, they have got in possession six gigawatt installed capacity only in hydro. And they are investing their decision already done in order to invest in modernization and rehabilitation, and not only modernization and rehabilitation, in replacement of the equipment, hydro equipment, which is really very much encouraging. And I would say also that it will be difficult to push forward for wind alone and for solar alone without hydropower, because you need a lot of capacity for the network. And then what we, we do, what we do actually when the wind is not blowing or uh, sun is not shining, what, what is the solution? To go to the fossil fuel and burning the coal and uh, burning the gas and then polluting and NOx and greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases or to rely on forgotten giant hydro having uh, not intermittent base power clean without any emissions? So I think the, the answer is, is very simple. Yes, for hydropower, investments, investments in hydropower. This is, uh, I would say, a top priority today for European Union and for all European emerging countries. And we are observing this situation and we, have, we are very much encouraged to see that company like uh, large utility in Poland, like PGE, is already investing in rehabilitation, actually in replacement of second largest palm storage power plant in, in Poland. The name is Porob Kajar. Maybe you know about that. Huh? So we are very much encouraged about that. We are very much encouraged as well to see that the private investors in uh, Estonia, Estonia, by the way, is not mountainous country. It's a pretty flat country. And uh, I, we are very much amazed that even in Estonia, the private investor intends to build pump storage power plant, which is unique of its kind, because investor intends to utilize Baltic seawater. It's, it's tremendous. I mean, it's, it's so nice to see such a development. Same in Greece private company intends to build greenfield pump storage power plant with the total installed capacity of 680 megawatt amphilochia. So we in GE are voting for this forgotten giant and we would like to see as much as possible investments in, in, in hydropower in order to achieve very important goal, mitigate climate change and to have a, a smooth transition and accelerate digital and green tra transition. Okay, thanks. Um, we've heard from, you know, three uh, energy suppliers, if you like, who are going to save the planet. Um, Zabka, obviously, energy consumer, major energy consumer, because, you know, you're such a huge company in, in Poland. What's a consumer going to do to, to save the planet? You know, I mean, I know that Zabka is, um, you know, decarbonization and clean energy. It's a key point of your, you know, your business transformation. You spoke this morning very, very well about, you know, some of the things that you're doing, but, you know, it would be good to, to hear again and to hear more about what, you know, your, your, your strategy is really, if you like. Yeah, it's good that we can talk about uh, from different angles, mm -hmm. because from our point of view, it's the matter of decarbonization, not only resilience, but also decarbonization. We have our decarbonization strategy and earlier responsible strategy, and we know that is the new way of doing businesses, doing businesses for creating the value for people, for people, the customers, business partners, we are focusing on creating the value. And in today's world, the value means it's not equal to money. So for us, creating a value means also minimizing our impact on the environment. And decarbonization is a solution for that. And the energy, the renewable energy, is one of the important pillar 
of our decarbonization. So that is why we are interested in it. We are looking for a solution. We are investing in our own installation and we are uh, we are, we are looking for and waiting for the hydro, for example, or for the wind farm for the offshore in Poland. So we are still uh, still in that discussion. And as, as a part of the United Nations Global Compact Network in Poland, we are also participating in that discussion. So for us, it's a matter of commitments that we made, commitments for, the, for example, carbon neutrality to 2025, but also 70% um, um, of uh, intensity emission reduction in our stores and we are consuming a lot of energy in our store so for us we are interested in the renewable energy but also for the energy effectiveness at our store because we all need the energy so we should know we should learn how to use it effectively and that that is our focus uh, that our main focus so that's why we are creating for example that that year we are opening a new low emission distribution center with three generation based on biogas with uh, installation of photovoltaic um, uh, farm uh, on our, on the roof two megawatts so it's a rather big installation i would say and we also need uh, another um, energy uh, to uh, to run our stores. So we are looking for solution for energy effectiveness and also for uh, hydrogen offshore uh, that can help us to uh, achieve our goals that were public um, and were published in our ESG report. And it's a matter of, uh, let's say, uh, responsibility for businesses to be in that discussion and to be in the front line of that new solution. All right, thanks. Drew, I'm going to come back to you. Um, you know, I know that you're involved with some, you know, organizations and companies pushing innovation in energy. Um, and what I want to know is, you know, how hard a sell has it been to convince, you know, investors to, you know, put their money into, into these things, to put their money into new technology? I mean, has there been a, a change recently? Have they become more aware of the need to actually get their money in these things? Or, you know, is it still a hard sell? Is it going to get any easier, basically? Can, can you be optimistic? <laughs> I'm always optimistic. Uh, is it going to get any easier? Uh, no. Um, but uh, but the, the economic opportunity from a capital standpoint and from an environmental standpoint, uh, the long duration opportunities for just sustained, sustainable capital and technologies is just unlimited. So it's just an incredible opportunity that, that cannot be ignored. Um, you know, having said that, look, I, I joined uh, the U.S. Department of Energy uh, focusing on commercializing clean energy technologies back in 2007. Uh, and, and at that time, the uh, Silicon Valley venture capitalists were flooding into the space. And then about five or less than 10 years later, they basically all dropped off, um, primarily because it is so hard. Um, you know, you can scale in terms of an, you know, I saw a chart the other day that, that uh, in, in the US iPhone penetration, market penetration, in about 10 years had reached 90%, right? If you look at the renewable energy penetration over 20 years, it's about 5%. Uh, of total primary energy use. So it is a complicated business to scale in. Um, and yet I think what I've also seen recently is a lot of those venture capitalists that, that were in and then out are starting to come back in again, but perhaps with a more realistic, realistic perspective and knowing that this is a long-term investment. This is not a three to five year exit. It's a 10 to 12 year exit. Uh, I think the other thing that gives me much optimism is you look at large family offices, guys like Bill Gates, who are putting a lot of their own money into this uh, clean tech space, and, uh, and partly because they're wanting to solve the issue of climate change, but partly because they see the economic opportunity. Uh, so I, I think um, you know, th there is just a, a tremendous amount of opportunity there. Um, the, the one of the biggest challenges, I'll say, is, is actually not the innovation. Um, in the United States, hydro, actually, if we could double our existing hydropower, technically speaking, like within five years, if only the government regulations would allow it. But in many cases, it's environmental regulations that actually get in the way of deploying clean energy technologies. And so this is a real, uh, I think, wake up moment for, you know, hardcore left environmentalists and, and center right 
uh, you know, capitalists, free marketeers who believe in technology innovation and always wanting to leave things better than they found them, I think there's an opportunity here to really find a way to streamline regulations in a way that it's good for all energy, whether it's renewable or solar or wind or hydro. Uh, you know, we really do take an all the above approach. And back to your first question, I mean, because of Ukraine and because of where, where Germany now sits with its energy vulnerability based on some political decisions, um, we really have to put energy security, diversification, resilience front and center. That's great. I mean, you know, kind of moving on from that, you know, Teofil, I mean, um, you know, you're going to have, or, you know, ideally you're going to have, you know, gas running alongside, um, you know, the power you're generating in the, in the Black Sea with the wind farms. I mean, do we, you know, as a region, as a world, as a planet, do we still need to realize that for the foreseeable future, there is no silver bullet, you know, whether it's wind, whether it's, um, you know, hydro, whether it's solar, whether it's anything, we are still going to have to rely on fossil fuels, you know, for the time being. And, you know, people need to realize that, you know, because I think there is a, a certain number of dreamers in the world who think that, you know, tomorrow we can just switch off fossil fuels and, um, and start using only renewables. Yes, as a specialist in, in energy, because I, I work for 10 years in the National Control Center, and I, I saw how difficult it is to balance the national system. Um, I'm a big fan of green energy, solar, wind, nuclear, energy, green energy, clean energy in general. In my opinion, Hydro, with the old hydropower plants, because now it's very difficult to build new big uh, hydropower plants, will be not enough. Maybe for a period of time, we have to keep for balancing gas power plants. Uh, for a period of time, for transitional project uh, have well, to be it, it patient. It is a transition. I mean, we're talking about energy transition. That, that, exactly. That's the idea. Yeah. It's not, you know, Otherwise, we'll be two, two big dangerous situations. One is like this, when the price is very, very high, or the technical danger to cannot keep the entire system, European system, in a safe function. So that even our solution in high voltage DC helps a lot in balancing and at the same time in transporting uh, high capacities because uh, high voltage DC cable of 640 kV could transport 3000 megawatts. At the same time, it's a very uh, friendly with environment, it's underground, it could be placed along with other, say, utilities, corridors, it's very easy to install. So we don't have to chop down any more trees to, to make it happen. That's the, yes, yeah. exactly. And with interconnection between different countries around you, you can balance so that the percentage of renewables energy, unpredictable energy could increase. Okay. Um, Alexander, I mean, you know, you mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, it sounded as though you wanted to encourage lots of other countries to adopt hydro. You know, I mean, who have you got your eyes on in particular? Is there any way, any, you know, country in this region where you think, you know, maybe you know, that's got great potential for hydro. I mean, where do you see the potential being? Exactly, yes. Uh, I, I, I really encourage all these countries to, uh, in the Eastern European countries, and uh, in order to develop the hydropower, and especially pump storage, because I have a very, uh, very actually um, clear understanding that this is the future, and it will be good replacement for coal-fired uh, uh, thermal power plants. One of the example, for instance, would like to tell you again uh, about Poland. 
because in Poland, uh, the country which has got the installed capacity of 35 gigawatt, they are moving and developing, as I said, replacing and modernizing one, the second largest pump storage power plant uh, in the country. And the uh, intention is to build completely new pump storage power plant with the 750 megawatt installed capacity. So from my point of view, uh, Poland gives um, as a pioneer in construction of such a pump storage power plants, gives... Um, Hear about Poland being a, a pioneer in renewable energy is... Uh, uh, Poland is moving in the, in, in, a, in the correct direction, I would say. Poland is developing offshore wind Poland is thinking about the pump storage hydro. Poland is, is thinking to reduce, uh, actually burning the, the, the coil and uh, burning uh, emissions, I mean, uh, reduce uh, emissions, NOx, SOx, and so on. So uh, from my point of view, Poland is in very proper track to, to move uh, during this transition period to move towards the clean energy and green, green energy. And the, the pump storage power plants, I would say, I don't know whether you have been visiting that, that type of hydropower plants. It's, it's two big lakes. And it's, it's not only the, 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 the installed capacity and generation of electricity, it's a recreation. If you go to that site, you will see, especially now during the, the summertime, that young couple, the young families with the children, they are enjoying next to next to beautiful lake. I mean, it's amazing. When I see that what we are doing and what we are trying to build, it's not only that to generate the power, but it helps families to spend their time and uh, in a very nice way, in, in very preserved, green and clean environment. So uh, from my point of view, country like uh, like yeah, like Poland is really doing very well and and Greece as I said decision is to move forward for uh, construction of greenfield pump storage power plant on Philokia it's it's tremendously important decision there and there are some some potential in North Macedonia I would say uh, which were, which is also very much encouraging and in Romania, Romania, La Pustetti, for instance, this is the pump storage power plant, which is on the agenda as well. So it means that uh, those governments, from our, my, my understanding, are in, in, in a proper way. Do, uh, they are moving in proper direction in order to achieve uh, net zero emission. Because exactly in order to achieve that, you have to start today. You have to start investing today in order that in 2050 to achieve that goal. Otherwise, that goal will not be achieved. And it's very, very important. If we want that our families, our children, go outside in a clean nature and breath freely, we have to address this issue today. And we can address this issue by hydropower. And not only hydro, because hydropower will encourage and boost wind and solar as well. Reserves and capacity of hydropower in pump storage power plant cases, it's, it's a tremendous trigger for the stability of the network from technical point of view, meaning that you can develop wind, meaning that you can develop, develop uh, solar. So... I'm absolutely convinced that this forgotten giant uh, hydro uh, power has to go forward and to, to be on the, on the top of the agenda. You're, you're a great advocate for it. Um, Anna, I'm going to come back to you. Um, you know, Alexander just said, you know, we, we need to make this change today. I mean, Jabka's, you know, your you know, strategy has been in place for, you know, a couple of years now. Um, you know, I want to know, also looking at this from a consumer point of view, I mean, a company like Zabka, you know, it's such a big company with so many customers. What kind of impact can you have on consumer behavior 
and I'm not just talking about energy here, I'm also talking about, you know, circular economy and, you know, these kind of things. I mean, how, how big a role can you, can, you, can you have? Yeah, I think that maybe today we are celebrating because, as, as you said, we have a strategy and we announced it a few years ago and every year we publish an EEC report and climate report when we have our flagship initiatives that our customer, customers and our business partners take part in it. Uh, so, to the, so, so today is that day. Uh, so first of all, we are focusing on innovation and that is, uh, that, that is, that, that is the first fact. And we are not waiting uh, for uh, the hydropower, we are not waiting for the offshore, we are, want to combat climate change uh, with the startups and, uh, and uh, with the business partner. And uh, last year, we opened incubator of uh, new ecology technologies. And uh, it's a store, a store in which we test 17 solutions with business partner, with startups that want to test with us some solutions that are not uh, checked. For example, um, kinetic uh, floor, the floor that uh, transform every steps you take into energy. It's a very novel technology that we want to test and we want to work on effectiveness. Second, uh, so it's a quantum dots uh, in the window. It's also produce energy. And our customers are visiting our stores and seeing that technologies because we're rolling out it, rolling it out to the, all of our stores. So last year, uh, we uh, also managed to uh, invest in circular economy, in ecomat machines. In Poland, that deposit system doesn't exist. We are the leader on that. Because we want to um, make sure that every um, uh, every small innovation counts. We want to test it and we, want to we don't want to miss any innovation that is important. We will wait for hydrogen, we will wait for offshore, but we won't uh, take, uh, we, we won't stop and wait. We would like, we would like to uh, deal with that. We would like to look for the new solutions. So our customers can do shopping in Jabka, can use our match fit, which is a, a part of our convenience ecosystem and can, uh, can in every decision they made, they are sure that they are doing something good that it's uh, good for the planet and also healthy for them. And that is our mission. And our mission is to simplify people's lives, creating value, but simplifying lives. lives. And we are really flexible in that. And we are trying to, trying to, trying to be uh, a leader in that uh, combating climate, climate change. Not stopping, not waiting, but trying to deal with that, trying to look for the solution, look for the startups, look for the new innovation. And I think that is the right approach. On the one hand, there are some companies who specialize and uh, working on the solution on the renewable energy, but business shouldn't wait. Business should, uh, should also act and try to um, try to work on effectiveness because we need so much energy now to consume and there's a lot of to do to do it uh, more effective to run the business in a more effective way because uh, the um, uh, amount of energy energy that will be produced in a renewable way is not frankly speaking enough to cover all the needs that the business have Okay, and, and, and what about the consumer reaction? I mean, have you got any feedback from consumers in terms of, you know, these things you do, you, you know, you've been doing? I mean, that, 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 that interests me as, you know, as much as anything else. You know, what are customers saying? Yeah, they, they love to be a part of the solution. They love to create the solution. And I think that is the most important. Uh, if we propose them even small steps, for example, on our packaging, which is, uh, which is fully recyclable, we give them some labels that help them to, uh, to um, decide to which bin they should throw it away. Really small things, uh, but they love it because it's easy. It's easy, it's simplifying their lives, and they don't need a lot of effort to do it. We also eliminate all the plastic bags from the stores. It's, you know, you cannot buy uh, the plastic bags uh, in the Jabka store. You can go, you, ten, you can take the paper one, or preferable, you uh, don't need it. Frankly speaking, you have your bag, you have your hands in the convenience format, you don't need a bag. And the customers love it because they understand that their day steps, their day effort, the very small step, but that's matter because if you multiply it by 3 million customers per day, it's a huge effect and huge impact. And I think, and that 
decarbonizations, I think, have two sides. One is the company responsibility and the things that we are doing and the, that, that things are not visible for the customers because they don't know how much we are doing in the terms of energy effectiveness. They don't understand that the refrigerators are really climate friendly and so on. But on the other hand, uh, it's the things that the customers can do to be, free, to be a part of the solution, to be a part of the road. And uh, that's why I believe that it makes sense to be and to behave responsibly in, and do the things that people don't see, because it's our own responsibility, but also give a chance to customers and to business partners to do some, even the, sm the smallest step, but it counts if you multiply it. All right, I've just got a notification that we need to, to wrap up, unfortunately, because um, there was uh, there was a lot more we could have could have discussed. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, and, you know, I, I wish that the four of you were in charge of, of energy policy in uh, throughout the region. Basically, I think we'd be in a much better. A much if better I place. can say something, we today published the climate report and the ESG report. Only 200 pieces were printed and I have a few of them with me. So if you want uh, to receive it, I uh, highly uh, recommend you to come to me and talk. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.